I would like to welcome you all. And it's an honor for me, obviously, to have such a, a great panel here and also to welcome you also to the second panel of the German Pre-Presidency Conference, Shaping the Future of Europe. The title of this panel is the EU's differentiated future after Brexit. No doubt this topic is highly relevant and very interesting and it is also very crucial for us uh, facing now the decisive period of negotiation which should probably end this summer but uh, we will see what COVID, uh, what the COVID-19 pandemic will have, what influence it will have. And uh, I'm also very delighted to welcome over 190 uh, registered participants. And uh, I hope all of them will participate in the entire meeting. Yeah, and yeah, before I will give you an introduction in the topic, I would like to first uh, give some, some short description how we how the panel will be structured. So the entire session should last for one hour. And I will first give a short introduction to the topic and then present the speakers. Each speaker is then invited to give a short input state statements around five minutes. After that, we will start the discussion and you are therefore also welcome to write your questions in the Q&A chat or at least to give a message that you would like to ask a question. To ensure a high efficiency of the discussion, I think it would be great. We would be very grateful if you could uh, write to whom the question is directed, so that we can directly uh, refer to the person who is in charge for the question. At this stage, I would like also to introduce Vittoria Meisner. Uh, Vittoria is currently working as a research advisor at the Institute für Europäische Politik in Berlin, uh, where she also researches in the Horizon 2020 project, EU idea integration and differentiation for effectiveness and accountability. So she's also an expert in differentiated integration, which is the overall theme of this uh, panel. Victoria will collect the uh, questions uh, in the chat and will then ask you to put the question to the four speak speakers. Victoria also has the role as a backup moderator in case I have some technical difficulties, you never know. Uh, Vittoria, would you like to introduce yourself or just say hello? Yes, thank you, Christian. I think you did already everything. Thank you so much. So hello to everyone. Perfectly. And um, so as soon as the, the speakers have given their inputs, then we will start uh, with the discussion. And um, again, you're very, very welcome to, to ask questions. Let me now introduce the topic, today's topic. After the referendum, which took place on the 23rd of June in 2016, and the UK's decision to withdraw from the EU, Brexit became now official or official this year on uh, 31st of January. As a result, the UK and the EU have entered into complex negotiations on their future relationship during the transition period, which currently is in place and will, will last until the end of this year, probably. We don't know yet. However, the negotiations have recently been overshadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Both the UK and the EU seem to be willing to strive for an agreement in order to avoid major economic distortion. Nonetheless, the risk that the two parties will not conclude a substantial agreement is still present and might have even increased due to the influence of the COVID pandemic. The clock is again ticking. And I'm wondering how realistic the UK's ambition is to have a deal by the end of July. The German presidency will need to work towards an ambitious and comprehensive partnership uh, between the EU and the UK to ensure that the negotiations are brought to a successful, successful conclusion on the basis of the jointly agreed political declaration and the negotiation mandate of the European Commission. This entails that the future partnership must be based on a balance of rights and obligations and fair competition. However, the UK is seeking a free trade agreement with the EU without an elaborated institutional framework and is not interested in a level playing field. If the UK succeeds, succeeds with this approach, this might set a precedent that could 
inspire other non-member states such as Norway or Switzerland to renegotiate the legal relations with the EU. With the EU. At first sight, Brexit uh, has reduced the extent of differentiated integration with, uh, within the EU. As the EU member with the highest number of opt-outs has now left EU. But how long will this effect last? Will the EU member states now work together more closely? This will be an interesting question that will be always addressed by this uh, panel. At the core of the Brexit debate is the economic impact uh, of the UK's withdrawal on the, on the EU. Brexit takes place in a time where the world is hit by the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Will this increase the pressure on the EU to agree on a deal with the UK that is less harm, harmful for the economy and that is less harmful than a no deal? We will see. These are some questions on you know, a highly interesting and relevant topic, and I'm looking forward to the inputs of our speakers and the following discussion. The panel has four participants, and I would like to welcome Axel Dittmann, Brigitte Lafan, Hunda Tatin, and Frank Schimmelfeni. The first speaker is Axel Dickmann, who is Director of EU Institutional Affairs, Brexit, EU Coordination, and EU 2020 pre Presidency at the German Federal Office. Until recently, he was Ambassador for Germany to Serbia, a position he held from 2015. Mr. Dickmann already gave an excellent keynote this morning, and I'm looking forward to your thoughts about the EU's differentiated future after Brexit. Mr. Dittmann, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, hello. Sorry, I uh, was a bit late. I had a problem to enter the, um, the, uh, uh, the meeting, but I uh, managed to, to, to get your introduction. And I'm happy to, to speak. My problem is I already spoke this morning, as you said, so, so uh, I, I, all my chips are gone. But, uh, so I'll speak a bit about the, how we approach the uh, negotiations uh, with the UK, how we see it. Um, um, the UK has uh, uh, left on the 1st of February. This, the EU, this is a fact now. We have to uh, make uh, the best out of it to negotiate a ambitious uh, agreement, which uh, uh, is good for both sides. Um, we have a good uh, uh, basis, which is the political declaration, which was endorsed by um, the EU, and which was also negotiated and endorsed by the British government. So we see with a bit of uh, uh, concern that uh, uh, in the discussion so far, the EU, uh, UK seems to go uh, a bit away from the political declaration. And while the political declaration is not a legally binding text, uh, uh, it is really something uh, both sides have uh, uh, spoken at length about, and it is a, a good basis to, to achieve uh, uh, an agreement uh, of such a uh, uh, wide scope uh, as we haven't seen before uh, in uh, third country uh, 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 agreements of the EU and uh, for which we usually I think uh, then would take many years to negotiate and here we now have uh, I would say I don't know two three months left for the uh, 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 heavy lifting because uh, as i said this morning the united kingdom has made very clear and now it's also uh, legally binding that there will be no um, extension uh, request and thus no uh, extension of the um, interim period uh, which will end on the 30th december which means the uk will then leave the single market so um, we want to uh, uh, um, use the time well. We believe it is uh, possible to strike a good deal. The uh, two negotiating teams are now uh, meeting in a, a very intense setting, um, starting from Monday. Um, so far we had these uh, parallel negotiation rounds. Now they will really um, 
uh, uh, meet also in a smaller setting with two teams uh, all the time. And so we hope it will uh, be uh, possible to make uh, movements, but it's not just enough to meet all the time. You also have to uh, um, make uh, uh, progress on substance. And for us, uh, the political declaration remains the uh, guiding principle. We want to have a, a broad-based agreement encompassing the different elements with a um, uh, uh, also um, common governance structure. We don't. Uh, we are not looking at a. Uh, repetition of uh, uh, the, the Swiss construction. Um, we want to, um, at the core of the negotiation, will lie, of course, a free trade agreement. Um, we cannot copy there uh, uh, some agreements that we uh, have uh, done in the past. Every free trade agreement of the EU is unique. Uh, and uh, we have to take into account that uh, the United Kingdom is a, a very big country, a very strong country, and a country which is extremely close to the EU. So this offers uh, great opportunities for both sides, but it also means that we need to uh, uh, have a, a very close look to uh, ensure a fair competition framework, and this is the code name for the EU has said, has made it clear from since 2017. So no one can be surprised. Uh, and it's of course part of the, um, of the, uh, um, of the negotiations. Uh, we also want to have a, an agreement on the fishery, which is of course an important uh, um, uh, um, issue for us. But we want to go broader. We want to look at internal and external security also on internal security. Um, this is a tricky thing. The EU, UK, is, has, is a non-Schengen country, has been a non-Schengen country, is now also a third country, and therefore is not bound by uh, our uh, also legal framework, etc., data protection rights, etc. So how do we share information there? This is something we have to look at. And then we also have the external dimension where so far uh, uh, the, the UK has not been willing to negotiate on this uh, and so all of this together shows us with many other elements like uh, transport etc that uh, there's still some uh, work to do and we hope that uh, the discussions which are going on now uh, will go into a good direction uh, the EU is speaking uh, with one voice and that's Michel Barnier now, for your uh, uh, question, what does it mean for the EU's differentiated future? Um, I think we have a differentiated present already in the EU, also uh, while the UK was a member. Uh, we have the Eurozone and Schengen area, uh, cooperation, justice and home affairs, we have PESCO. So we already, we have a, a, a Basically, we, were, we, we moved together as uh, the EU as a whole, but there are already subgroups uh, and uh, these flexible forms of cooperation uh, are something that uh, which enables us that some countries move forward and others, this is of course always uh, open. Um, but of course, uh, that the EU, uh, that UK has left, uh, puts, uh, is, is a challenge for us. Uh, we, we see it, uh, for example, uh, um, right now in the discussion uh, on the future MFF, where uh, 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 a big contributing uh, member states is no longer on the table. Um, we, um, I would say that looking into the future with the UK having left, uh, there is a number of, of uh, issues which we want to look at uh, in particular. Um, and I would say that uh, uh, one area where we really want to uh, uh, make sure to have a, a, a close uh, cooperation also in the future is the uh, issue of uh, foreign policy, uh, um, where uh, it is important. Uh, we believe that the EU, uh, that the UK, who is a, which is a very, very close uh, um, partner for us uh, in a way, uh, works together with us on key foreign policy issues and uh, does not take we do this in uh, small informal circles but uh, uh, with the EU as a whole I think this is something which we think is a uh, important uh, issue. So 
um, we are in the middle or in the final or in the decisive moment of the negotiations now and uh, we want to lay uh, 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 and uh, arrive at a uh, result which makes it possible for the EU to cooperate extremely closely with the UK also in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dittman, for this uh, very interesting input. I think there is a lot of things which we can discuss on uh, later on. So I would like to uh, go on and give the floor to Brigitte Lafan. Uh, she is director and professor at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies in Florence. And this is an interdisciplinary research center at the European University Institute. Um, yeah, Brigitte Lafan has uh, done a lot of research about European integration and especially about the dynamics of European integration and also about the future of the European Union. So the floor is yours and I'm very interested in what you have to say. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. It's a pleasure to join you from, uh, from Ireland. Uh, let me begin by uh, COVID-19 and the Brexit negotiations. I think there is a clear desire now in London for a deal. And that was not the case even a month ago. Why do I say that? The UK government has had a bad COVID-19. It has impacted on the domestic credibility of the government. There was a sentiment that perhaps that they could hide the fallout of Brexit in the early part of next year with the economic fallout of COVID-19. Uh, they are less confident of that now. And in my view, uh, Boris Johnson's government needs a deal. Uh, and that really matters because he ha it, is a part it is a government driven by ideology. It is a government driven by politics. Uh, and it is a cabinet with a lot of hardcore Brexiteers. So in other words, from an EU perspective, this is a very difficult negotiating partner at this stage. But in my view, there will be a deal and Johnson needs a deal. And I think that's a very good thing from an EU perspective. The nature of the deal is more difficult to judge. Uh, it's an asymmetric negotiation between the UK and the EU. In order to get to a deal, the EU will, of course, have to compromise. But in my view, the UK will have to compromise more. And it's not quite there yet in accepting the consequences of uh, exit from the single market and the implications uh, of Brexit. From an EU perspective, I would say it would be very important to have a dynamic capacity in the agreement. What do I say? Why do I say that? Because London will not always be governed over the next 10 to 20 years by hard Brexiteers. And regardless of where we start, I think there will be a strengthening of the, uh, of the relationship and the partnership as time goes on. But the UK has got to get over this frenzy of uh, politics and ideology. I think so it has to be dynamic or have a dynamic potential. The second thing I would say is it's absolutely crucial to the EU that the governance mechanism of this relationship has, is coherent and is institutionally robust. Why do I say this? Otherwise, if it's a fragmented agreement with lots of different the dispute resolution mechanisms. It is a recipe for friction. And the best thing that can happen in the EU is that it does not appear on the front pages of the British tabloid press in the years to come. So it's very important that the British uh, EU relationship uh, becomes less heated in the period ahead. And I think governance, a single governance mechanism is extremely important. Secondly, in terms of the economic and political costs to the EU of maintaining its present red lines. Well, in my view, the EU has really has no choice. It can compromise, but only within limits. Because 
the EU has got to protect the gains of integration. It's got to protect the single market. It's got to ensure that any partnership or relationship with the United Kingdom is based on a balance of rights and obligations. Membership must matter because this is the first member state to leave. Yes, it was a differentiated member state, the opt-out uh, member state, but it really does matter to the future of the EU uh, that that balance of rights and obligations is maintained. But within that, there can be a strong and dynamic partnership. But it's essential also, in my view, that the EU maintains its coherence and its unity to the end. Because if, it, if the EU does not do that, then obviously its negotiating capacity uh, is weakened. But I see no evidence that the EU will not maintain uh, its unity. And finally, may I say something on the internal differentiation in the United Kingdom? because uh, Brexit has meant the two parts of the United Kingdom, Scotland and Northern Ireland, are being taken out of the EU against their wishes, against the majority of, uh, of their electorates. Uh, and that means that when the EU develops its relationship with the United Kingdom, it's got to be attentive, not just to London, but to Edinburgh and to Belfast. The differentiation involved in with Northern Ireland is dramatic uh, because effectively Northern Ireland will remain within the EU single market and broadly within the customs, uh, the customs code. Uh, and that, that is managing Northern Ireland is extremely difficult. It has destabilized relations between the two communities in Northern Ireland and it is a potential neuralgic point for the relationship ahead. So managing that uh, dimension of Brexit will always be complex, but extremely important. And then Scotland, 62% of the Scottish electorate voted to remain in the EU. That was the most decisive vote in the British referendum four years ago. The Scots are being taken out against their will this has driven a demand for independence, but London will not concede another referendum to Scotland, in my view, in the, in the lifetime of this, uh, of this parliament. And therefore, uh, the EU must carefully monitor what's happening in Scotland. 54% of the Scots today say they would vote for uh, independence. That may, that's pretty soft, I think, and it may not, uh, it may not it, would, it may not survive a referendum, but it could be that it, over the next cycle, part of the relationship with Great Britain will involve dealing with an independent Scotland, which again is, would be another very complex set of negotiations and political dynamics to manage. So I leave it there and look forward to the, dis the discussion. Thank you very much, Brigitte, for this uh, very valuable insight, and especially also the UK dimension. I would like to give the word now to Frank Schimmelfenning. Frank Schimmelfenning is professor of European politics and a member of, this, of the Center for Comparative and International Study at the ETH Zurich. He also chairs the scientific board of the Institute for Europäische Politik in Berlin, and is also a member of TEPSA. So, his research focus is for differentiated integration for some years, and so he's a real expert in this topic. And I'm um, interested to hear your input statement. Please, Frank. Yeah, thank you very much, Christian, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, in my remarks, I will uh, focus on the likely effects that uh, uh, Brexit is going to have on the internal differentiation of the uh, European Union. <clears throat> um, as we've said already, um, the UK, closely followed by Denmark, uh, was the champion of differentiated integration in the European Union. No other member state um, opted out of EU policies as much as uh, the UK did. And uh, the UK was also the main advocate of uh, scrapping the principle of ever closer union uh, in European integration. Um, now, in addition 
uh, now that the UK uh, has left, it will be the most important European non-member state of uh, the European Union. So it is important to ask what will happen to differentiated integration after Brexit. Now my my answer may be surprising, maybe not surprising answer is uh, not that much. Um, and I will show you a few charts to illustrate my points. So Mr. Kluchert, if you would please uh, start the first slide. Okay, uh, so the, the first slide shows um, the number of active treaty-based differentiations in each year. Um, and the downward tick that you see in 2020 here, that is the uh, Brexit effect. Uh, it is quite substantial, so it's, uh, it's about 15% reduction of differentiation year on year. But if you compare it to previous years, it is nothing extraordinary. Um, similar changes have occurred frequently in the past 15 years, and the eye will broadly remain at uh, the level it has um, arrived at after the uh, post uh, after the 2004 enlargement. Now on the next slide, we uh, uh, turn to differentiations in EU legislation, yeah? so moving away from the treaties. Again, we see uh, a downward tick, which is a, a visible one-off Brexit effect in the order of 10% uh, for 2020, always assuming that nothing else happens, of course. Uh, but it is very similar to earlier post-enlargement effects in, in its magnitude and uh, basically does nothing to compensate uh, the extreme rise in secondary law differentiation that we've seen over the crisis decade uh, in, the, so in, the, in the past 10 years or so. And finally, that would be the, the last slide. Um, uh, let's look at what Brexit does to the, to the spatial structure of differentiated integration in the European Union. Um, so over the past three decades, we've had a, a rather stable picture here, um, a three-tier uh, structure that has developed in the European Union uh, with a large core of member states that are fully integrated into all policies of the European Union then some kind of semi-periphery, mainly uh, consisting of non-Euro area member states, and then let's say the, uh, the maverick periphery, which is Denmark and the UK, uh, with opt-outs from uh, almost all uh, core state power policies uh, of the EU. Now, if you uh, remove the UK from this picture, it's, it looks like the three-tier structure will collapse into a two-tier structure with uh, just Denmark as a lonely outlier. Uh, now, it has been suggested by some observers that uh, when the UK leaves, uh, the opt-out countries would be deprived of their most powerful member and anchor, and that this would generate some kind of centripetal movement in the system with, for instance, Denmark and Sweden integrating further with the Eurozone. Um, I think, however, that this is uh, unlikely to happen. Member states' decisions to opt out from certain policies have uh, generally been uncoordinated national moves. Uh, there has never been such a thing as a UK-led coalition for a different kind of European Union that would now break down uh, that the UK leaves. Uh, moreover, in Denmark and Sweden, non-participation was not a decision of governments, but resulted from negative referendums, and it is unlikely that Danish and Swedish voters will change their mind because the UK left. And I think this, the same is true of uh, Central and Eastern European governments, uh, skeptical of supranational integration in the EU. So I don't see Brexit as a game changer for differentiated integration in the European Union. And I think the same conclusion, uh, given the high uncertainty that there still is, applies to the impact of uh, Brexit on external differentiation. That is the kind of uh, institutional structure that the EU has developed with non-member states. Uh, all we know at this point is 
that uh, any kind of agreement that uh, uh, may be um, ne ne negotiated over the past, uh, over the next two or three months, will be rather minimal, will be idiosyncratic, uh, not some kind of new institutional model of external differentiation, and uh, uh, certainly um, less ambitious than the external differentiation of the other Western European non-member states. So I, ex I expect the EU to make sure that uh, Brexit uh, will uh, not undermine um, the integrity of the internal market, but uh, it will also make sure not to produce, uh, and that, that's something that uh, Christian has, has mentioned at the beginning, it will, it will make sure not to produce any kind of attractive alternative to the more institutionalized relationships that the EU has with the uh, European Economic Area or that, ha that it has recently negotiated with Switzerland. And I'll leave it there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. And now I uh, would like to give the floor to our last speaker. It's Funda Tekin. She is uh, probably known to everybody because she is also the organizer of the event as the director at the Institute of European Politics in Berlin. Uh, Funda has already managed it once to put the entire real reality of differentiated into integration into one figure, which is quite impressive and um, also quite inspiring. So I think I would like to give the floor to you now. Yes, uh, thank, you. thank you, Christian, and thank you to all my previous uh, speakers. Um, and uh, indeed, I'm going to reshow this graph also today. And it actually also kind of takes up what Frank has more shown in a more thematic graph right now on his last slide, because I think um, this is uh, then nice, nicely fits into one another. Because uh, what I want uh, to, I basically want to take up where Frank uh, um, has left off by extending a bit uh, the thoughts on the Brexit and the EU's future of uh, external differentiation. And I'm also, uh, I also prepared a, um, um, a slide, so a presentation, so I hope that I can share that with all of you. Um, I hope you can see it. Um, and uh, yes, because um, I want to uh, elaborate the Brexit and uh, use future of external differentiation by basically three assumptions. Um, and um, the first assumption um, or is a guiding assumption that I have de developed within the framework of a Horizon 2020 project that assess the future of EU-Turkey uh, relations and that I'm also uh, currently looking further into within the framework of the research project EU IDEA, which is one of the three Horizon 2020 projects dealing with differentiated integration, just like uh, the INDIF EU project who has also organized uh, this panel. And this assumption is um, uh, differentiation can make the separation line uh, between EU membership and non-membership thinner because as it becomes the new normal of European integration, scope, nature and, uh, and form of membership as such will transform too. Um, and let me explain a bit further and also assess on the likelihood of it because I think there are lots of terms also included that might need a further elaboration. Let me start by differentiation, because I think this is a very broad term, also differentiated integration, that uh, deserves a uh, def definition so that we know what we have in mind uh, when talking about it. So differentiated integration basically means that one group of member states is not subjected to the same union rules as others, as a very basic um, definition. And this uh, refers to any modality of integration or cooperation that allows states, members of the EU and non-members and sub-state entities to work together in non-homogeneous, uh, flexible ways. So um, this then also relates to um, subgroups uh, that were already mentioned. And uh, it, um, I think it's uh, the best way to picture it. As I said, uh, Frank has already shown basically the, the well, figures, great figures of it. I'm always working with a uh, more, um, colorful picture and uh, I repeatedly show that, but it's always something to change in that picture. So this is uh, what I have in mind when I say, you know, uh, differentiated integration might render 
the, um, uh, the separation line between uh, eventually between outsiders and in, uh, insiders thinner because if you look at the extent of already existing differentiation and also the um, external um, circles around the EU you you know the more this trend in, increases um, both internally and externally eventually um, we might then get uh, to the fact that um, uh, it's you know the borders of the EU are rather diluted or at least softened so the United Kingdom, this is what we're talking about, has um, stepped out of, of uh, the European Union. So, and we do not know yet how the relationship is going to look like. Um, with regards on the likelihood, how likely is that the assumption that the um, uh, separation line is getting thinner by a differentiation? Uh, you can think about different aspects. And the first is to consider the reactions within the context of Brexit. So in the run-up to the Brexit referendum, it was uh, very evident that also EU institutions started to officially acknowledge differentiated integration to be an option for future integration. So you could read that in uh, the conclusions of the Council, uh, European Council and the uh, European Council documents that then said that um, those who want to deepen integration uh, should be allowed to, uh, ahead while it's respecting the rights of those which do not want to take uh, such a course uh, in order to be allowed to remain outside or behind. Um, and also after the Brexit referendum within the uh, Bratislava process uh, and then the Juncker's uh, white paper on the future of Europe, you had five scenarios and also uh, one scenario clearly explicitly dealing with the option of differentiated integration. So who, um, those who want to do more uh, should do more. So one can, one can establish that differentiated integration is part of the picture of future scenarios of European integration, not only in academic terms and uh, practical terms, but also in the uh, politically acknowledged. But how likely is it to become the new normal, also in view of external differentiation? And I think here it's also important um, to then think about what Bridget said, member state, uh, membership does uh, matter and needs to matter. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, you know, one reason why external differentiation then always creates or generally creates an asymmetric nature with the EU being the decision giver and uh, the third country the decision uh, taker. So uh, according to the current treaties, there is no such thing as a partial membership uh, because Article 49 TEU grants full rights and obligations of membership only to those countries that have exceeded the EU. Uh, and this mostly relates to the right to sit, and this also relates to the right to sit at the decision-making table in EU institutions. So uh, this means in institutional terms, currently separation, the separation line is existent and is not likely to go away, regardless of in what uh, scenario or model of future um, association forms you look at. Um, and you would actually need treaty change for diluting the, this line altogether. However, at governance level, of course, and this uh, were the subgroups that um, uh, Mr. Dittmann was referring to, um, there is, you know, cooperation possible with PASCO or also being, uh, being linked to Europol or uh, CSDP missions. So you really do have uh, uh, cooperation forms uh, also in the external dimension. But, um, so my first conclusion would be that yes, the more the EU differentiates, the thinner the separation line gets, but we are not talking about partial membership yet. Um, the second um, assumption then is, uh, and this is links up to a discussion that then came up after the Brexit um, referendum and the decision to, to exit. And this, this was then, you know, if we can get something positive out of it, it's, well, we're gonna get a blueprint for forms of the use external differentiation. And um, Frank has also already touched upon that, uh, that question um, because um, it's, I mean, sorry to have to say that and disappoint you basically maybe, but uh, you know, the Brexit cannot serve as a blueprint for future uh, forms of at least forms with other countries because um, it is clear that each country is different and um, there was this um, discussion that was very close related to um, seeking alternatives to accession to, uh, of Turkey to the European Union. And um, here it's also a difference between, you know, a member states exceeding the European Union or exiting the European Union. So, um, but if it has at least a, a one effect and a positive effect on external differentiation, 
is at least that it sparked a debate, and not only within Europe, but also within Turkey, for example, who then were, um, at least within the academic debate, um, really considering alternatives and it was more freely uh, discussed, um, although the, the term privileged partnership in Turkey is uh, what I always call a non-word and is not really well perceived. So um, this is just something, so, um, you know, there was the discussion, but I would say um, this is something to further look into it. And this is why then my, my third, um, uh, third assumption or statement is basically that both future UK-EU relations demand a tailor-made approach, just like future EU-Turkey relations. Um, and this basically counts for all third member states, because I think you have to look into what already exists what the preferences are of such, uh, um, uh, such uh, relations, and also the condition conditionality within. Because I think one basic conditionality should, of course, be uh, the core values of the European Union. So you need to have, uh, you need to have a rules-based uh, perspective. And if you then would basically kind of draw the line you know, from the core of the picture that I uh, show on this display to you earlier to the um, outer fringes, you can then kind of identify different levels of, of models with uh, a pre-Brexit UK model, which is then more a patchwork membership, so to speak. You can then also consider something like the Poland uh, model in terms of uh, having a membership uh, that is not really um, uh, willing to exceed all policy areas and is more, you know, also uh, subjected to internal conflicts. You then have the Norway model that we all know and also the Swiss model that um, Mr. Dittman was already um, referring to. And then you have, of course, the European neighborhood uh, policy model. You have then on a very looser end more strategic partnerships. And then if you want to uh, take it all the way down, you also have a a model of full-fledged conflict uh, where you simply have no formal relations or at, at least suspended formal relations and that example is Russia. And I think I'm just going to end it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have now four very interesting inputs uh, from the four speakers and I would like to give the floor now to Vittoria. As I see in the Q&A and A chat there ha uh, have been some questions and yeah. Okay, yes, thank you, Christian. Thank you to all the speakers. Indeed, uh, I have several questions, so I will uh, follow the order uh, in which they were asked. So first of all, I have um, two questions for, her, uh, for Mr. Dittmann. Um, the first question is from uh, Peter Christian Müller-Graf, um, who asks um, uh, Mr. Dittmann about um, the fact that he used the phrase, we hope, quite often. Uh, so the question is, do you see so-called red lines from our EU side? Uh, and before um, Mr. Didman, you can answer, I have a second question for you from uh, Professor Yaptezvan, who asks, in view of the very short deadlines connected to the possible need for ratification by 27 plus one national parliaments, what are the chances for the broad agreement you were referring to? So before moving on to other questions I have, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Dittman to answer. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, well, um, on my, my English, I'm not a native speaker, so um, um, don't read too much into uh, how I um, how many times I, uh, I use this, uh, a specific word, but um, I don't want to say that uh, you should uh, um, take my words uh, with more caution and, and uh, read into them a uh, certain skepticism. We do um, hope that we can uh, uh, achieve uh, a good outcome. We believe that the political declaration uh, on which, uh, to which both sides agreed um, forms a good basis. And now we really have to speak about the substance. Um, I think that the uh, EU does have some very clear positions. Uh, it has expressed all the time and they are absolutely uh, cannot be uh, any surprise for, for anyone. 
um, and that is that we will certainly protect the integrity of the single market, the functioning of the single market. Um, I think that uh, also our um, current experience uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic shows us that uh, the single market, next to our uh, common values, uh, rule of law, etc., is really the bedrock of the European Union. And uh, this is something uh, where um, um, we will absolutely uh, uphold this principle. And if you look also at our negotiating mandate, it is very clearly spelled out. So, so therefore, um, um, we do want to have an uh, ambitious uh, deal, um, but uh, we cannot make a compromise on the functioning of the single market. And I think that is, that is very clear. Um, but of course, we are open now on that basis to, to explore. Um, what we can what we can do it is a negotiations between two uh, um, fully independent uh, uh, actors uh, the United Kingdom has left the EU and now we sit together and try to uh, work something out um, on the second question of the ratification I think that is very interesting um, we will really have to see what kind of if we manage to uh, get an agreement what kind of agreement will we have? Which kind of, uh, or which uh, uh, areas, substance areas uh, will it cover? Um, it might be an EU only competence deal, then we will only need, only in inverted commas, a, a, a ratification on the European side by the European Parliament. If we um, add member state competence uh, inside, it will uh, require a a ratification by all the national parliaments and in some countries, as we all know, also some regional parliaments, which would make it much more complex. Um, I think we'll have to see um, what uh, comes out at the end of it. If you look at the, at the core of this uh, free trade with uh, 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 level playing field conditions and the governance, you are um, there is a high likelihood that it will focus on EU competence, uh, which would then make ratification process easier. But we are guided, of course, by the substance and let us see what comes out of the ne negotiations. If I may add also one uh, comment from uh, uh, me on the um, very interesting uh, comments of the other speakers, I want to say that I agree um, with um, uh, functional funding and Funda Tekin on the question of the uh, external and internal uh, differentiation. I, uh, I agree. I also believe it will not be a game changer for external differentiation. We have to see this is as a position uh, also of, of one uh, uh, member state uh, uh, oops, leaving, leaving, and now we have to uh, negotiate. Uh, 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 something and it will not be a, a blueprint uh, for third country uh, uh, um, um, relations of the EU and it will certainly not dilute uh, uh, the category of, of membership. Um, I think that uh, the membership uh, will be very clearly, is very clearly defined and, uh, and, and it will be uh, quite a different thing. It will be, there will be a, a a clear difference between being a member of the European Union, being a member of the single market and being outside. And that is, uh, it has been clear uh, all along uh, and, and it's a shared view of the EU27. I also find interesting uh, uh, the analysis, uh, intriguing analysis on the internal uh, differentiation by both of you. And I also agree that I don't think it will be a game changer for differential integration. Uh, internally, uh, but what we do see, or what we have seen, is that there are some kind of uh, shifts in alliances, that uh, it is a very important uh, member who no longer is present at the table. Uh, and for example, when you look at also this formation uh, of this uh, new Hanseatic League, where then some countries start to work together uh, uh, more closely, I, I mean, we have to see how permanent something like this is, but uh, it certainly, while we don't have a, like a new uh, differentiated, uh, differentiated integration within the EU, it certainly does have an impact, of course, on the way uh, uh, members uh, relate with each other. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dittmann. And now I have um, two questions for um, Professor Lafan. Uh, one is from uh, Brandon Donnelly of the Federal Trust. Um, he asks you um, whether there is not a danger that the poor performance of the British government on COVID-19 will at the end of the process drive the Conservative government to adopt an intransigent position in the Brexit um, negotiations. And I also have a second question for you, Professor Lafan. Uh, I hope for the participants it's fine that I'm collecting. Um, from Gabriele Abetz, um, who asks, how likely do you think it is that the UK government will also accept to follow social regulation with regards to the many directives that are important for gender equality in the UK? So, Professor Lafan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, Brendan, uh, yes, there is a danger. But I think that that danger will be outweighed by a, a calculation in London that a deal, a no deal, is not something that the UK is ready for and that the disruptions would be very problematic for any government. So I can't, I, I think there will be a deal. Why do I say that? Firstly, COVID-19 the supply chains held, and they held because the UK was effectively still in the EU broadly in the transi transition period. So the UK is dependent on the import of food. If those supply chains are hit via disruption, it hits governments very, very quickly. And we saw the stockpiling at the beginning of COVID-19 in the UK. So I, I just can't see a government, even this government, uh, doing that. And the second are that dependent, the, the Conservative Party are trying to build that wall. In other words, they, they, they broke the Labour Party red wall and they're trying to maintain that now. But that part of the UK is very dependent on manufacturing and on, on supply chains as well. So regardless, I think we're going to hear a lot of the sovereigntist arguments. We're going to hear a lot of huff and puff from uh, Johnson over the next couple of months. But just like he did at the end of the withdrawal agreement negotiations, I think he will, um, he, he will want a deal rather than no deal. Uh, now, that's my judgment and it can only, uh, it can only be a judgment. In terms of will the UK accept the social regulation gender, I think that, that the EU will press for no regression. So in other words, that the EU will hold what has already been agreed. But of course, uh, the, why Brexit unless you diverge? I would expect probably uh, the UK to diverge in some high profile areas simply to be able to show divergence, in other words, symbolic politics. Uh, but are, would it be better for citizens of the UK to have the added scaffolding of EU social regulation? Absolutely. There will be dangers there with this Conservative government and with the uh, kind of majority that it has. But I think the EU will certainly hold the line on no regression. Thank you so much, Professor Lafan. Um, I now have a request to ask a question by Professor Yain Beck. So, um, Yain, uh, we will now um, unable, um, yes, unable your microphone, and then you will have to switch it on uh, to ask your question. So please do so. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, I've clicked the unmute button. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, Negotiation means compromise, and compromise means some group has to be disappointed, or put it more graphically, thrown under the bus. In the, in the withdrawal agreement, it was Northern Ireland, or at least Northern Ireland Unionists, who were sacrificed so that Boris could get his deal. In the things that are most contentious, I agree they're difficult, but in many ways they're not that complicated. If you take the example of fishing, it's a line in the North Sea in other fisheries and a, a quota. 
will it be the fishermen of Boulogne-sur-Mer and Ostende, or those of Hull and Cornwall? And I doubt there are many fisherwomen involved, so that's why I say fishermen are going to be thrown under the, the bus. And is the readiness to throw somebody under the bus the real political obstacle to, to getting a deal rather than the technical negotiations? Uh, I just want to ask if you want to address the question to somebody specifically or... Um... Well, maybe a combination of uh, Bridget and uh, Axel. Okay, then uh, the floor is again yours, Bridget. Uh, so I, I, I would distinguish in these negotiations between uh, the impact of, uh, of the disruption that Brexit will cause on different groups but, and the overall structure of the negotiations, of the deal, sorry, of the partnership for the future. So I think that on the issues of fish, I think the EU's maximalist position on fish will change and there's hints it's already changing. And given the reciprocal access that the UK needs to the single market to sell fish, and fish, fish, uh, fish need markets, uh, then I think there's a very possible deal there that will hopefully uh, not be seen by either side in terms of those fishing communities as problematic. And fish is in uh, fish in in volume terms in terms of the uh, UK economy and the European economy is is very small. I think for the for the UK a far more problematic area has to be services, because I can see no circumstances under which the UK will get such a good deal on services that that important part of its and of course I understand services is very. Um, there are lots and lots of different areas and services, but I, I'm amazed that so little attention is paid in the UK to services. And then on the overall architecture of the deal, I think uh, the, the UK, London, this government would love a, a deal that allowed them to uh, have different sectoral uh, dispute resolution mechanisms have a very segmented agreement so that they could obfuscate exactly what was going on. That is the worst possible outcome for the EU. The EU needs a deal that has a balance between rights and obligations. It needs transparency and it needs governance mechanisms that make those obligations and rights uh, very clear. So I would say on the architecture of the, uh, of the agreement, uh, the EU will hold very firm to uh, an overarching governance structure and a limit to segmentation. And I don't think that's technical, I think it's profoundly political. Thank you so much, uh, Brigitte. So with an eye on the time, uh, Mr. Dittman, the floor is yours, and then I will ask one last um, question. Well, thank you for this uh, question. Um, but I'm not sure whether um, uh, to arrive at a deal means that uh, someone has to be sacrificed, uh, one party has to be the loser. I think we uh, can both benefit uh, greatly from a good uh, agreement. Um, we have to see that it will be a difference to being in the single market because the United Kingdom and, and to membership overall, the United Kingdom has taken a sovereign decision to leave the European Union. So there will be a difference. Uh, uh, and, and if you look at from there, that it will be, of course, a minus. But that is not a sacrifice. It's a political decision which has been taken, which has now been um, implemented and uh, ratified. And, uh, uh, but if we compare uh, the, the situation between not having an agreement and having an agreement, it is really, I think, beneficial for, for both sides. If you look at trade, uh, if you look at uh, cooperation in internal security, external security. So I think uh, um, this is, uh, I wouldn't call it sacrifice, I would call it compromise. And we already have a document where 
the main compromises have been described that is called the political declaration and now we have to put this into legal terms and of course there will be also an element of political negotiations but i think we do have a good basis uh, and uh, we hope that we can now make real progress on that basis Thank you so much. Um, so now, as I said, with an eye to the time, I'm sorry for those participants that I cannot um, allow to ask their questions or make interventions. I have um, questions for uh, Professor Schimmel, wenn ich, um, for Frank and for Funda. Um, so the first uh, question from Adrian is, if we look at the single market legislation, we see increasing use of um, regulation. Uh, is full harmonization the direction of the single market? What level of differentiation can the single market handle? What happens to policy competition? These are actually more than one question, but maybe you can um, summarize. And then um, one further question um, to Frank um, from Alexander Schilling. Uh, is whether um, considering um, different dynamics that you have highlighted in the presentation during the sovereign debt crisis, the absence of the UK will uh, make it more difficult for Euro outsiders to make their voice heard in future discussions on how to reform the Eurozone. So um, first, if it's okay, uh, Frank, and then um, from that, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for those questions. Now on the internal market, uh, the the internal market has really been uh, the most important policy area in the EU with uniform integration. So we've seen uh, rather little and over time decreasing differentiation in the internal market. That has uh, uh, somewhat changed uh, as a result of the crisis uh, because of banking union, yeah, which uh, uh, brings um, uh, differentiated integration to the uh, financial dimension of the internal market. But otherwise, uh, we've seen uh, a general trend towards uniformity. Now, in the internal market, of course, there are other ways of uh, providing flexibility. Differentiated integration is not the only way in which the EU can, can do that. Uh, uh, here we see uh, other instruments like, like minimum harmonization, yeah, that gives leeway to countries, uh, this, this, this discretion in the implementation of certain rules. Um, but I think the, uh, uh, it has been a long-standing principle of the European Union to allow differentiation uh, in all kinds of policies, uh, but to, uh, minima uh, to, uh, to preserve the legal uh, unity of the internal market. And I, I would think that uh, uh, this uh, principle has been um, strengthened a lot uh, 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 during the uh, Brexit negotiations and will be one that the EU uh, will be uh, very reluctant to sacrifice. But as I said, there are other ways uh, to create flexibility. Now on Alexander's question, I think this is an, this is an important point. You refer, I guess, to the uh, double majority requirement in the uh, European Banking Authority, yeah, where the UK made sure that uh, the majority of Eurozone member states uh, could not impose decisions on the minority of um, non-Euro area member states in the um, uh, EBA. And, and you're probably right uh, that uh, uh, these kinds of institutional mechanisms will be more difficult uh, to have in the future when you don't have a big member state like the UK backing them. Yes, uh, yeah, I think Frank has already comprehensively um, answered um, those questions, but I can also underline that I think if Brexit had an effect with regards to the single market, it's just, you know, the, um, the recollection of the importance of the single market uh, that we have to stand together in that area, um, also with regards to the four freedoms that they cannot be compromised. And I think if you want to have a, you know, a solid uh, negotiation point vis-a-vis -vis, um, the United Kingdom, uh, you should also live that on, on the inside. But uh, yeah, so there are other, I mean, if we're talking, this, this was also why I was providing a definition in the beginning, because of course there are different levels of differentiated integration and differentiation, and if you want to have flexible uh, integration, so um, there are other, um, other forms to, uh, to provide flexibility in that 
regard. And I think also with regards to Alexander's uh, question, and here I would simply really also refer back to what, uh, Axel, how Axel Dittmann then reacted also to the analysis uh, provided by Frank and myself. Um, and this is then uh, the discussion about the shifting of alliances within, uh, among the member states. And I think this is really something that uh, where the United Kingdom and the exit of the United Kingdom has an effect. I mean, we saw both in the pictures of, of Frank and, and my picture that the United Kingdom has been already at the sideline. However, it was uh, still an important member state. And so, of course, we have to, um, in, in addition to all this legal analysis and how far, you know, differentiated integration might be set up in the future, we also have to look at the uh, alliances and member state groups within the European Union. And this is something for the future to also assess in greater detail. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. thank you very much, Vittoria, also for uh, coordinating and moderating all the questions. And thank you uh, to all the speakers. I think it's the time is already over now. And I just uh, give a brief summary and make some concluding uh, remarks now. And, I think that the panel has uh, shown that Brexit is a real challenge. I think it's an economic challenge, a political and a legal challenge. We have a tough time frame now. Uh, we have a high level of politicization and we have a wide range of policy that has also been illustrated uh, at the beginning. So a wide range of policy and a wide range of interests that we have to face. I think the EU benefits from, uh, still benefits from an asymmetric negotiation setting. Uh, this has been become clear here in, uh, by this panel, especially has this negotiation setting or this asymmetry even increased due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, as uh, Bridget Safran has pointed out. You will also uh, keep on to speak, go on to speak with one voice. I think, uh, this as Axel uh, said, and uh, by this, the EU will also keep on going to de define the supply conditions of differentiated integration, which is mainly to protect the autonomy of the single market or the decision making of the EU and also the integrity of the single market. And I think these conditions are very important, and, but still negotiation as, as it has been uh, remarked by an, uh, an participant negotiation means compromise and also that the speakers have highlighted that both sides will make to will have to make some compromises i think one of the key messages of this panel was that brexit will not be a game changer for the dynamics of european integration it will not be a game changer for internal differentiated integration and also not for external differentiated Taking this into account uh, that the, the Brexit will not be this game changer, I think it's good to uh, go over and look to the other challenges that the EU face. And I think this is a good uh, way to refer to the further program of these TEPSA conferences, because these are also topics which are of high relevance and uh, which also need a lot of energy and resources. And we, as in a European uh, setting, we also have to discuss. Uh, those uh, topics. And the next chat session of this conference will start at half past four o'clock and it will be a round table discussion with a parallel session. There will be one on migration and asylum, and the other one will be on enlargement and neighborhood policy. I think uh, we are all very happy to when we also participate in this uh, uh, two round table sessions. So, Finally, I would like to thank again to all the participants, for, and especially those of them who have put some questions. But I also would like to uh, say thank you to the four speakers. I think it was a very interesting panel. And if you would like to get more information, uh, there are a lot of Horizon projects, three, actually three Horizon projects dealing with differentiated integration, especially one uh, uh, where Freya Pritchard and Lafan is. Uh, uh, dealing, uh, Bridget Lafan is leading at the Robert, Center, uh, Robert Schumann Center at the University of Florence. So I think there you will find a lot more information if you are interested in it. And thank you very much for your time. And I hope you enjoy it, it, this meeting and will follow the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.